Now we're talking to Alex Martini, the author of a new book called Tracks, uh, Racing of the Sun, uh, talking about the legendary figures of uh, early days of motor car racing. How are you, Alex? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for having me on. No, thank you for, for your time and uh, thank you for uh, bringing back these uh, memories. I mean, fascinating people that most people now have forgotten, I guess, huh? Uh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, although you know, there's still a, a little bit of a fascination in the old days, uh, but yes, absolutely, a lot of people have forgotten that there was, there was, there was Grand Prix racing before Formula One racing, and so they, they built the foundation of, of what we see today. Yeah, so the, the book is uh, based in, in the era between, what, uh, 1934 and uh, 45, uh, pretty turbulent. Uh, uh, times in, in Europe, no? Yes, exactly. Um, it, it's pre-war, so it's basically mostly to do with the Italians, the, the Alfa Romeo and, and the Mercedes-Benz and the auto unions and the German and the Italian drivers of the time, um, who were sort of the biggest guys around the world at that stage. Yeah, it must have been a very, uh, very, uh, a, lot of, a lot of work, I mean, very detailed work to research all this, because, uh, I mean, uh, where did you find out all about all the, the, the documents and, and everything about these people? Yeah, the research was actually quite fascinating. It took me, it took me about a decade to do because most of the uh, information is, is firstly in Italian and German um, because in those days they, they, they ruled the roost um, and more than that of course is because it was during the time of the Nazis and the fascists um, a lot of the information was sort of given in a way that was meant to yeah, what well, was basically propaganda so trying to find out actually what was happening as opposed to what they were saying was happening was, was one of the, the, the more interesting things um, for instance Akira Valsi was in 1936 he being a morphine addict, um, but at the time they, they didn't actually say that. What they said was, oh, he was a little bit sick. You know, so there was a lot of stuff hidden in the background. And of course, um, there aren't a lot of biographies or even autobiographies. Um, a lot of the guys didn't actually write, and so a lot of the information was very difficult to find. But once you actually start finding out the information, it was the most fascinating um, um, project I've ever Excellent. So, um, what what inspired you to, to write this book exactly? Well, uh, well, the inspiration, funny enough, came from an article that I wrote uh, that I read actually on uh, I think it was uh, Motor Racing magazine back in I think 2001 or 2002, um, and it basically touched on Akira Valtz's morphine habits and this this woman that he fell in love with, this, this German woman, um, and I just thought you know, the, the story was really fascinating. And I came back to New York and I did a bit of research and I realized that actually nobody sort of knew what happened to the woman to begin with. She kind of just disappeared. Um, and he's, you know, the whole addiction thing was sort of not really known about in English-speaking circles because actually the only biography ever written about Valtteri was in Italian. It was a very small book that was written in 1992. Yeah. Um, and the more I went into it, the more I thought, you know, this is really fascinating. And, and it became a, a sort of a quest to find out what happened to, to the woman that he fell in love with who apparently turned him on to morphine and, and, and made him into a drug addict. And, you know, it was the whole Nazis and, and, and the fascists. So it was just it was so fascinating. The more I sort of explored, the more the more questions I had to answer for myself. So yeah, like happens with just, yeah, like it happens with everything, right? The more we know, the more the we we find out we don't know much about things. Correct. Yeah, the more the more answers we find, and, and the more questions actually come up from the answers. That's exactly right. Yes. Yeah. So, what are the some of the personalities that you uh, re, um, discover in your research for the for the book? Well, the personalities I, I focused on four of the, of, of the biggest drivers of that era um, because. I guess the book just lent itself to... Uh, the book started off as a project on Valtteri and, and these other characters sort of came into it and I, I sort of got so fascinated. So you have uh, Tatsu Nuvolari who was uh, Italy's, uh, fascist Italy's great icon. He was, you know, the guy that had no fear. He literally had no fear. Yeah. Uh, you know, he would just have these, these means of accidents and just walk away and just keep driving. Um, yeah. And basically, wanted to die on the racetrack and actually never got around to it. And then you had the Germans. Um, a guy called Rudy Caracciano, who, despite having an Italian name, was actually completely German, and um, he actually used to, you know, he, he's one of the big drivers of, of the time, who actually used to hand deliver um, um, Adolf Hitler's Mercedes Benz. He used to actually hand deliver them because that was kind of his job, as well, opposed uh, to actually being like a great driver, right? Wow. And of course, there was there was Bernd Rosemeyer, who was this very young guy, this 25 year old guy, who was um, the Nazis' ideal. Uh, man at the time, of course, because he was the Aryan wonder, you know, yeah. blue-eyed and, and blonde-haired and, you know, the member of the SS and whatever, and he was sort of promoted into the old auto union team and, and, and sort of um, Hitler's youth, he was the ideal of the Hitler youth, 
And of course, when he died in, in, in 38, going faster than any man in the world, uh, his propaganda value became so important to the Nazis because they were preparing, obviously, for the war, and they wanted these kids to sort of look at this guy and say, well, look how he died for the glory of, of you know, of the Reich and uh, of the Nazi Empire, and all kids should sort of emulate what this guy did. So his death was kind of the best case scenario for, for the Nazis. And it was really quite fascinating because he himself was not a Nazi. Um, he himself actually was very uncomfortable being the thing. But in those days, you know, if you wanted to be a motor racing driver, you yeah. had to tow the party line. You pretty much agree. So there were politics in auto racing uh, back then too, like today. There was, <laughs> of course, there was huge politics in motor racing back then. In fact, the, the whole uh, German teams, both Auto Union and Mercedes Benz, were completely funded by the Nazi Party as a way of, of a to be a propaganda vehicle for for Nazi Germany and the whole ideal of you know Aryan manhood or whatever. But on top of that, it was also a way for them to um, find out technological advancements because they couldn't actually make. Um, I mean, or arms or tanks or anything else because they'd obviously lost World War One and the Treaty of Versailles. So for them, in order to actually militarize and to learn technological processes like the engines and the lubricants of the oils or whatever, um, they went into motor racing. Yeah. And it was a legal way for them to actually make a lot of the engines that were actually in the German cars and also the Italian cars were used in the uh, the fighter pilot, the fighter jets, well, the fighter planes yeah. um, in the Second World War. And uh, what about the actual, I mean, you mentioned a little bit about the engines. Uh, what kind of uh, horsepower can kind of things, uh, how, what kind of uh, cars they were driving in these days? Right. Well, that's actually the fascinating part is because a lot of people sort of look back and they think, oh, 1930s, there must have been these old little slow cars. Um, these cars at one point, uh, towards the you know, 1937, 1938, were producing about 600, 700. Wow. Um, Big cars. I mean, the, exactly. I mean, the fastest man in the history of, of, of road, on actual, on a public road, um, is Rudy Caracciola. He did it in 1938 at 400 and, I think, 430 kilometers an hour, and no one has beaten that record to this day. It still stands. That's um, amazing. These cars were incredibly fast. So, um, and you're only talking about, you know, they weighed 800 kilos, and 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 you know, so typically on a road course, I mean, they didn't race on 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 real tracks. They raced on on public roads, and you know, at Pescara, for instance, this road race in Italy, they would reach 370, 380 kilometers an hour. Yeah, and nothing to compare with uh, safety measures like today. Yeah? I mean, there must have been a lot of uh, pretty bad accidents back then, I guess. I don't know. Absolutely. I mean, if you had an accident in those days, chances are something bad would have happened. In other words, you would either be maimed or killed. And actually, there was uh, the dying rate or in terms of the racing drivers was actually higher than they did in, in, in the World War One flying aces. Um, it was a hugely uh, dangerous sport. I mean, no safety belts, no, no helmets. Uh, no crash barriers. You know, no crash barriers. If you went off, you went into the trees. Yeah, I uh, once, uh, I once had yeah. the had the opportunity to go to the Mercedes Benz uh, Design Center, Classic Center. I'm sorry, in uh, Stuttgart, and I saw one some of these cars, and they were like pretty much thin cans with wheels in the engine. I mean, they're on a seat. That was it. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the Auto Union, which was actually designed by uh, Porsche, who obviously went on to make the, you know, the Porsche. Yeah. Um, he designed this car. The, the skin of the car was actually made of well, aluminum. If you actually pressed it with the finger, you could actually dent the skin yeah. of these cars. That's uh, how light they were. And they were running yeah. over 300 kilometers, which is like 250 miles an hour. Amazing. 250 miles per hour, exactly. And, and the reason, when you see the whole photographs of these guys holding these big steering wheels, the reason why they had the big steering wheels is not because they didn't know about small steering wheels. It's because holding onto these steering wheels is the only way they were keeping themselves into the car. Exactly. Um, because they didn't actually want anything to keep them in the car if they had an accident because flying out of their car um, like in motorbikes is actually, was actually the best way for them to actually survive an accident because yeah. inside the car they had no chance because these cars were made basically they were just so flimsy. So that was the protection a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean they were crazy guys. I mean, they were, I mean incredibly brave. You yeah. know? I mean incredible. But you know in, in those days life was not quite as precious as it is today. You know, especially for the fascists and, and the Nazis they kind of had an ideal that, that you know sacrifice was, was what people just cut it in. Yeah, indeed, uh, indeed a, very, a very fascinating book. Uh, Alex, so can you tell us a little bit about you and uh, where can our audience can find your book? Right, well, uh, me myself, I live up in Irvington, New York, um, and I do a lot of editing, and this is my uh, first non-fiction, well, fic historical fiction book. And uh, did, did, have you written about uh, motor racing before? This is the first uh, take of that. I, yes, I, I've written a lot of articles and magazine articles, etc. But this is my first book on, on motor racing. So where can we find it? It's everywhere, like uh, electronically and all that? It's available everywhere, uh, Amazon or Barnes & Noble, 
wherever you want, and it'll be available on September the 9th of the US, and it's uh, it's actually out now in the UK and Australia. Uh, so, Tracks Racing the Sun uh, by San, uh, by Alex Martini, I'm sorry. Well, fascinating book. Thank you for very much for uh, taking the time. And uh, One last question. Um, what's your opinion about the modern uh, uh, motor racing compared to the day's uh, feature in the book? Uh, well, it, it, it's changed a lot, hasn't it? I mean, nowadays we have, uh, I think the biggest difference um, is in terms of safety. Um, I, I don't think that, that the audience can stomach people getting hurt anymore or dying on racetracks, and so racing has become far more uh, safe. Um, I think because it's become more safe, um, racing has actually changed because uh, you know, a lot of what made a great racing driver in the 1950s and until the 1970s uh, was the courage and the ability to, to, to push themselves over what I think most people can do. Um, whereas nowadays, modern racing cars are probably are actually safer um, than your road going car. So you probably, you as a driver going on your motorway probably stand more of a chance of getting hurt than modern racing drivers. Whereas in the 1930s and 1940s, etc., the difference was that the chances of you getting hurt was far more higher. And I think that's the fundamental difference in racing. Otherwise, it still stays the same. It's, it's, it's you know, uh, certain people can do it and certain people can't. Um, even though a lot of us want to do it, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, most of us would like to become racing drivers, but in the end, there's only a certain amount of people that have the ability to do it because it's about balance, and there are just so many you know, different elements that actually make a person into a racing driver. And I think most of us can probably think that we can drive well, but if you've ever actually got onto a racetrack or a car track with a real racing driver, you realize that they have a, they have an ability which, which most of us just don't have. Yeah. It's just a natural ability, and that's it. Absolutely. Yeah, I actually have experienced that. So thank you very much again for your time, Alex, and uh, congratulations on your new book. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye.